Bibles, turn to 2 Kings 23. And we're going to be continuing our series uh, going through the Bible. And uh, I told Maria the biggest struggle I have in this is, is what to cover. I mean, you know, try to go through the Bible in 10 weeks to give you an overview. But there's so many things. And uh, so, uh, but we're going to focus on one today and take a theme. So, and just to bring you back up to speed, first week we looked at the creation of the world, the fall of man, expulsion from paradise. Paradise, the flood, the Tower of the Babel, Tower of Babel. Second week, we looked at God choosing one man, Abraham, and uh, God working in his life. God giving him Isaac as a son, then Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had twelve sons, and they went down to Egypt. And then the next week, we looked at Moses bringing them out of Egypt, where they had become slaves. And then the next week, we looked at Joshua bringing into them into the land of Canaan, which was the promised land where they established the, 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 the country of Israel with their 12 tribes. And uh, then we looked the next week of how they were ruled for a period of time by these uh, people called judges that God appointed. And uh, he, each time they needed a leader, God would just call somebody and that person would step forward and they would rule. So we look at the period of the judges. And then we look in the next week how the people said, we're tired of that. We want a king like everyone else. And God was not in favor of this, but he gave them what they wanted. So they got a king. And uh, so we looked at the period of the United Kingdom. You had three kings, Saul, David, Solomon. Solomon was very, very wise, but he turned from the Lord. And he built temples for false idols after building the temple of the Lord. Even though he turned back to God at the end of his life, damage was already done. And so as a result of his unfaithfulness, Israel split. And this is what we looked at last week. If you think of America, America, when we had our civil war, it was north versus south. Same thing in Israel, north versus south, except it, there was no reconciliation. They stayed two separate countries. The northern kingdom was then called Israel. We looked at it last week. Every ruler was bad. They uh, had some worse than others. Through the whole time, they worshipped these two golden calves that were set up in two towns uh, there in Israel until Israel was finally wiped out by the Assyrian army in 722 B.C. So this we're going to look at the southern kingdom, which was existing the same time as the northern kingdom, but actually existed about 150 years longer. And the southern kingdom was called Judah, after the large, largest of the two tribes that made it up. It still had Jerusalem as its capital, and it had a descendant of David on the throne in Jerusalem all the time. And Judah was different than Israel. They didn't worship the golden calves, but they had some good kings and some bad kings. Bad kings would come in and bring all kind of idolatry and horrible things along and then a good king would come and would purge the land. And we could go through and talk about all kinds of amazing stories but uh, we're going to focus at the very end of the kingdom of Judah. Uh, towards the very end they had the king that was worse than all the others before him. His name was Manasseh. He also ruled longer than anyone else. 50 55 years. So he was very, very evil. He built all kinds of temples to particularly horrible gods. And these gods were particularly horrible because the gods that Manasseh worshipped demanded child sacrifice. So he led the people of Judah and he himself took his own children and burned them in the fire to these horrible gods. And uh, God's anger mounted up during this time that Manasseh ruled to the point that God said this is it. Innocent blood has been shed and my judgment will surely come. It will not be averted. I will not forgive. I'm going to destroy Judah because of the innocent blood that Manasseh and the people have shed and killing all these children to worship these false gods. And I will just as a little aside say that I see if God's that way towards his chosen people in Judah, there's no way he's any different towards us in America. You know, since 1973, we have shed the blood of millions of children in the, what should be the safest place in the world, the womb. And they've been ripped apart and 
skulls crushed and vacuumed out. Just horrible. Murdered. And God... God takes it very seriously. He says, if you cause a little child to stumble, it'd be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown in the depths of the sea. Of all the sins we're guilty of as a nation, this is the one that God will not pardon. And God will, he's going to destroy our country. I don't know when, but he will. It will come back on our heads for what we've done because God is that kind of God. He did it to his own people. He said you'll be wiped out and America is not his chosen people. Um, we're a Gentile nation. God's been very good to us and he's blessed us abundantly but we have turned from him in a brutal way and a hard-hearted, callous, selfish way and, uh, and he will not pardon. But at the very end of Manasseh's life, in the last year, Manasseh repented and returned to the Lord and turned his heart totally toward God in the last year of his reign. You think, well, what good is that? How can it undo all the damage that he did? Well, it didn't per se immediately, but Manasseh died. And he had an eight-year-old son, Josiah, who became king. I don't know why an eight-year-old. He may have killed the others, offering them to these false gods. I don't know. But Josiah became king. And the amazing thing is that last year that Manasseh turned to the Lord, he must have taught Josiah something in that last year that undid all the evil he'd been doing for years before because Josiah then becomes not only the last good king of Judah but the most good king of all the kings including Solomon and David and everyone else in 2 Kings um, chapter 23 verse 25 the Bible says of Josiah now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses nor after him did any arise like him. So if you want to say who is the greatest king ever of the people of Israel some might say David but that's not true. It was Josiah. Uh, Josiah has been one of my top five favorite people in the Bible. I wanted to name a kid after Josiah but Maria vetoed it. She didn't like the name. Of course I vetoed her suggestion too so we ended up with Christian. It was a compromise but anyway. Um, but Josiah. So this great king. So obviously as I look it, you know, I've got 400 years to cover here. What am I going to cover? Well, I kind of knew it had to be something with Josiah. We're going to look at Josiah because he's my one of my top favorite people in all the Bible. And Josiah did. He became king at eight years old. He immediately started to seek the Lord. Once he was 18 and had full power, because you know, as a kid, he you know he was had stewards and things watching over him. At 18, uh, when he had full power, he immediately said, first thing we're going to do is fix up the temple of God." It was it was basically rubble. It had just collapsed during the, the reign of uh, Manasseh because it had been neglected for, for 55 years as people worshiped other gods. I mean, it hadn't fallen down, but it was in disrepair. So and there was rubbish and garbage in it. And so he sent the people in to fix up the temple of God and they began to repair it. And the last time the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned in the Bible, we don't know where it is today or what happened to it, but it's mentioned here because the Levitical priests had been like moving it from place to place to keep it safe because all this false worship was going on and they were hiding it and Josiah said bring it back to the temple. You can bring it back. And so as they're cleaning in the temple they find the book of Moses the book of Deuteronomy it was lost and buried in the rubbish and they bring it to Josiah and Josiah starts reading the book of Deuteronomy and he hears what God says he's going to do to his people if they ever turn away. And he knows what his dad did for 54 years. He knows about all the innocent blood that was shed and all the false gods that were worshipped. And as Josiah hears this, he's like, oh, we are in big trouble. So he goes and he finds a, a prophetess and he appeals to her and says, what can, what can we do? And he goes, he, he goes with his garments torn and he's in grief. And she says, there's nothing you can do. 
God's done. But because you humbled yourself before God and sought him with all your heart, I will delay the disaster as long as you live. I'll put it off. It will not happen in your days. So Josiah leaves from there, and he determines he's going to do everything he can to turn the people of Israel back to God. So he gathers all the leaders to the temple that's refurbished, and he says, folks, we need to repent before God. We need to make a new covenant with God after all the evil we've done, and he makes it. Then he sets out to destroy. He destroys all these false temples to all these false gods that his dad built. But even before before that, there were some that Solomon had built 400 years before that were still standing, and he obliterated them. He took, he took the, uh, the, the, the valley where the people would offer their children as sacrifice, and he defiled it. He took a bunch of trash and dumped all this trash in that valley so they could never be used for child sacrifice again. As a matter of fact, even in Jesus' day, this, this place was still the garbage heap. It was the landfill. It was a smoldering dump, and that's where all, he defiled it so it could never be used again for child sacrifice. But he he wasn't content even then. He looked to where the northern kingdom had been that was now ruled over by Assyria. It was, it's destroyed and there's there hardly anyone up there of Israeli descent. But he says, you know what? Those golden calves that led that kingdom away, they need to be destroyed. So he himself goes with an army and they take the one golden calf at Dan and they destroy it. And they come to the one at Bethel and they destroy it. And as they're destroying it, he notices this tomb over the side and he asked a few local people that are still there who's buried in that tomb and they say a prophet a prophet who 400 years ago came and preached against this golden calf and told us that one day God would send his man to destroy it and his name would be Josiah 400 years later Josiah fulfills this prophecy and destroys these golden calves and then Josiah says you know we need to celebrate the Passover we have not done it in, in decades and as a matter of fact it had not been done right for hundreds of years and so he calls everyone in Judah to come and then he sends a message throughout the northern kingdom to the few Jews that are still up there, the few Israelis that didn't get carried captive. And he says, come, come to the temple. Come, come. And, and, and up in the north, you know, the people make fun of some of these messengers, but a few faithful people come. And, and finally, there's this great Passover. And the Bible says... There was no Passover like it since the days of the judges. In over 400 years, there had been nothing like this. Not during the time of David, not during the time of Solomon, where the people sought God with all their heart. And so Josiah did all these mighty and great deeds of faithfulness uh, and doing everything he could to turn his people back to the Lord. And so that is why Josiah is my, my favorite. And again, just a little aside side as an American even though I know we're doomed because of our sin I pray that God will give us one more Josiah that God will raise up someone in this country that will turn our hearts back to the Lord and give us one last awakening and one last revival but even though there's all these wonderful things I could talk about or preach about about Josiah I want to focus on something that he did at the end of his life which was not a sin but which was a mistake. I want to talk with you this morning about mistakes. Now, a mistake is not a sin. Now, I, now let's, let's clarify. We are not talking about a sin. Um, now, the, the denomination that I grew up in, um, at a time period in that denomination, they taught that Christians never, ever sinned. And, uh, and whenever somebody would do something wrong, they say, well, it was just a mistake. But it was a sin. You know, lying is not a mistake. It's a sin. And lusting is not a mistake. It's a sin. But I want to talk to you about things that are genuine, real mistakes. They are not sin. They're not condemned by God. They're just stupid. They're just dumb. And, and even though God, God does not come down on us when we do these things, there's consequences of our stupidity. And God never condemned Josiah for the mistake that he made, but it had bad repercussions. Um, 
And so uh, that's what I want to talk with you about today, how to avoid mistakes. And then I want to end with what God can do with you to help you if you have made a mistake. We're talking about dumb stuff and things that, that could alter our life in a bad way or a way that's less good that could have some consequences that, though, are not sin. So, um, let's... Uh, let me tell you what Josiah did. We'll read the passages later. Then I'll give you a couple illustrations of what I'm talking about in our life. So Josiah's ruling. He's now 39 years old, which is great. Uh, he probably has 20 or 30 years left to live and rule. And during this time, he, is, he himself is protecting his people from judgment. Well... There's this king in Egypt named Pharaoh, Pharaoh Necho, and he is an ally, and don't get lost in all this history, but he is an ally with the Assyrians. Now remember, the Assyrians wiped out the northern kingdom, but the Assyrians are now collapsing. They, they're on their last leg because a new power has arisen in the east called Babylon, and Babylon is rising, and Babylon is going to be the people that eventually take out the southern kingdom of Israel. They're going to destroy Judah and destroy Jerusalem and all this, so Babylon Babylon is this, this rising force. Necho is allied with Assyria that's trying to hold back Babylon. And Necho goes on this military mission to rush up to the Euphrates River to help the Assyrians in this battle against Babylon. And in his haste, he cuts across Josiah's land, the land of Judah, without asking permission, on his way to this other battle. And this irritates Josiah. He's like, what are they doing cutting across my land? This, I don't like this. I, this is a sovereign kingdom. Who are you to race across my land without my permission? So Josiah says, I'm going to go fight him. I am going to fight Pharaoh. And so uh, Josiah gets his troops together and he starts to go. And Pharaoh sends an ambassador and says, this has nothing to do with you. This has nothing to do with you, Josiah. The reason I'm going up here is to help Assyria fight Babylon. I have no quarrel with you. I had to cut across your land. Stay at home. Don't meddle because there's something else you need to know. God told me to do this. God sent me on this mission in haste. Don't meddle with what God told me to do. But Josiah thinks, who is Pharaoh to be talking to God? God God's not going to be talking to this Egyptian guy. And so Josiah does not listen. And he goes to the battle, has this battle, gets defeated, and gets killed. And when he dies, Jeremiah the prophet writes this huge lament and weeps and says, this is it. He's the last good guy and he's gone. And sure enough, the Babylonians come in and destroy Judah and that's the end of the southern kingdom. So, uh, Josiah didn't do anything wrong. You know, God didn't tell him not to go directly. He, he made an error in judgment. He made a bad decision. He made a mistake. It wasn't a sin. He didn't break a Ten Commandment or do something immoral. He just did something dumb. And we have to be careful about that kind of thing. And so, when we think about making decisions in our lives, I, I remember back in the 90s, there was this, this big popular thing that was being pushed in Christianity that basically said, whatever is not prohibited is allowed. And so basically it said, you don't need to worry about daily decisions that you make or big decisions in your life. As long as you're not breaking a command of Scripture, then just go for it. Just go do it. Make the do whatever you want. And I remember the time I'm thinking that doesn't sit exactly right with me but I couldn't put my finger on why but you see the Bible says that every decision we make has a consequence of being a mistake that can affect our life so I remember back in in 1992 I graduated from college and I sent out job applications all over and mainly in Louisville and a few a little bit distance from Louisville and then one way distant from Louisville in Chicago and, uh, and I wanted to teach school and and uh, and I didn't hear anything from anybody and I remember a brother Sonny came to me and said hey can you lead our youth group here at church and I prayed about it and felt like the Lord would do it and I said yeah I'll do that it wasn't a paid position or anything just volunteer I'll lead the youth group. And about the next week after I told him I would do that, I got a phone call from Chicago. We want to hire you. 
Uh, we want to hire you to come up here and teach. Now, no one else had, had called. It was almost the end of the summer. I had no, no local job. Uh, we discussed this on the phone, and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll get back with you. Let, let me pray about this. Now, I want to say, taking a job in Chicago is not a sin. I could have taken the job in Chicago. God would not have condemned me. There's nothing in the Bible that says, do not work in Chicago. At least nothing I've found. But uh, as I prayed about it, I felt like the Lord said, this is not, you know, you said you were going to work with the youth. You can't do that. You just told him this last week. I mean, you could always go back and say, hey, circumstances have changed. But I felt like the Lord didn't want me to take that job in Chicago. And so I, I called and turned it down. Um, and uh, and sat here with no job for another six weeks until finally at the last second, two days before school started, something opened up. Now here's the deal. Had I taken that job in Chicago, I would not be standing here right now. Last 20 years, somebody else would have been the pastor at CIC. Had I taken the job in Chicago, I would not have the wife I have. My four kids would not exist. Um... Had I taken the job in Chicago, I would not have taken the job at Victory Christian Academy where I met Brother Gentry, who now runs the mission in Malawi, and all the people in our church who have just fallen in love with Malawi. That wouldn't have happened because that was the connection. That's how we knew about Malawi because I worked over there, and then when I became a pastor, he said, hey, I'm going to do this mission. So that wouldn't have happened. Little Lily is sitting there with the Hammonds, with Laura and Michael, and she would not be here. She'd still be in Malawi or someone else. So you just start going through all the consequences that come from this decision, do I take this job in Chicago? And that is why I disagree with the idea in the 90s that just make a decision. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to consult God on everything. I think you do need to consult God on everything. And that keeps us from making mistakes that will not only impact us, but everyone else. Because Josiah's decision to go into this battle affected everybody. It affected his kids who ended up getting killed by the Babylonians. It affected his country. It affected everyone. And that's why Jeremiah just cried when Josiah died. So, how can we avoid making mistakes? I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about bad decisions. How can we avoid making them? And what if we have made them? What can God do for us to help us? So, first, let's talk about how to avoid them. The first thing that Josiah did not do, and here's a man who you're reading all these wonderful things about, and he's doing all these right things, but when it comes to this, we never read that Josiah consulted the Lord. He did not consult. And he had all kinds of opportunity. The temple was restored. The priests were restored. The ark was there. They had this cool thing back in Bible days called the Urim and the Thummim. The, the priests carried these around inside the ephod. And they were these two stones. And if you needed to know God's will about something, you could consult the Urim and the Thummim. And uh, if they lined up one way, it was yes. If they lined up the other way, it was no. And then sometimes God wouldn't answer if they both opposed each other. And David always consulted this. Before he would go into any battle, he would call the priest, you know, not on the phone, he would go to the priest, call the priest to him, and say, consult the Urim and the Thummim. Should I go to this battle? And God would say yes sometimes, and no other times, but God would always give David an answer. So Josiah could have consulted the Urim, he could have gone to the temple, not in the holy place, but to the temple and prayed before the Ark of the Covenant outside and asked for God. He could have gone to Jeremiah the prophet, who was preaching in those days and was mightily anointed by the Lord said, what should I do? Should I get into this battle? Should I go in this thing? But when we read, we see that nowhere did he consult with God. Nowhere did he consult. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 5, and, and this is one, again, of my favorite verses because it is a promise without any 
caveats. There's no fine print. It says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The Bible says that as a believer, if we have to make a decision and we go to God and say, God, give me wisdom in this decision, and if we come to God in faith and ask Him, He will always grant that request. He will always give wisdom. You see, the Bible says that we believers have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And you know what Jesus told His disciples? It's better for you to have the Holy Spirit in you than to have me beside you. Because Jesus said, I'm going away, something better is coming. If I don't go away, you won't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that's better, that's better for you than have, having me beside you, to have the Holy Spirit inside you. Now, if, if Jesus was actually walking by my side, you think I wouldn't ask him about everything? I know, you wouldn't, so would I. Should I buy that car? Should I buy that house? What, what, what kind of offer should I make on this? Should I take this job? Should I take this promotion? Should I go here? Should I go there? Um, well, you know, what, what do you want me to do with my kids? You want them Christian school, home school, public school? Tell me what to do here. You know, uh, we'd be asking Jesus about everything. You'd ask him who, who you should marry and, and all kinds of things. He, we would be consulting him all the time. But Jesus said, it's better for you to have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So in other words, we can get even more clear direction than if Jesus was beside us by the Holy Spirit inside us if we seek God and ask Him for wisdom. You say, well, Pastor Brian, how does God give it? The verse doesn't say. It just says that He does. And maybe not instantly, and maybe not right away, but if we keep asking Him when we face decisions in life, then He will give us wisdom so that we don't make a mistake. Again, we're not talking about sin. But we're talking about things that can negatively impact our life. Running into debt or making a bad purchase or, or going into business when we shouldn't. Different things like that that could affect us in a bad way. They're not wrong. Are you talking to Jesus about everything? About every decision that comes your way? Don't go with your gut. Don't go with your head. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you don't utilize those things. But also consult the Lord. Also consult Him. Because sometimes He leads us in unexpected ways. Or something that seems like a no-brainer. He says, I, you know, you need to hold off on that. So... Seek the Lord Jesus' wisdom and He will give it. The second thing that this wonderful King Josiah did not do is consult the Word. Now remember, they would found the book of Deuteronomy and they gave it to the king. You know something fascinating? The, the book of Deuteronomy has a command in it for any future king that Israel will have. In Deuteronomy 17, verses 18 through 20, it says this, Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in the kingdom." He and his children in the midst of Israel. God said, when you get this book and you're a king, write your own copy of Deuteronomy. Write it out and then read in it every single day. And if you do, it'll keep you from sin, but it will also preserve your life. You know what's fascinating? The book of Deuteronomy gives advice about when you should go to war. And this situation with Nico was not one of the situations where God said, this is when you need to go to war. Had Josiah been in this book, reading it every day, he would have ran across that passage and he would have thought, this is not really wise to get into this war. This is a situation where God says, I'm not going to help you here because this is not the situations where God says, I will be with you in war. Now, folks, we don't have to write out our own copy of the Bible, but God has given us the Word of God. And this is why, if there's nothing else that you remember when I'm gone, if it's just this, Pastor Brian always said we should read our Bible every day. 
And by the way, read it all. You know, if, if Josiah just liked the first chapter of Deuteronomy and he just read that over and over and over again, it wouldn't have helped him in this situation. There are parts of the Bible that I get real excited when I get to, and there's other parts I'm like, oh, Lord, here we are again in this boring part. But you know what? Even in the boring parts of the Bible, the ones I don't understand really what's going on, God has spoken to me. Verses have jumped out of me. You remember a few years ago that book, The Prayer of Jesus? Jabez uh, that was written and it became a bestseller. Did you know the verse about Jabez is couched in the middle of the nine most boring chapters of the Bible? It's just this person had this kid and this person had this kid and this one had five kids and this one. I mean, it's the part of the Bible that if I was going to skip, and as a matter of fact, I will confess to you, there have been times when reading through the Bible, I have skipped this passage of Scripture. These nine chapters, I'm like, oh, I just can't go through all these names. I don't know how to say them. They mean nothing to me. But tucked away in all of that, and I believe it was Roy Wilkerson that wrote the book, is this wonderful gem about Jabez and the prayer that he prayed. And that book and that prayer have blessed many, many people. But the only way this guy ever saw it is because he was reading the boring parts. Some of us like prophecy, some like history, some like reading about the miracles in Acts, some like the poetry in the Psalms. But you got to read it all the way through. You got to read the Bible all the way through, not necessarily in order, but a book at a time. Maybe one in the old, one in the new, but make sure you work your way through the Bible so that God can speak to you. Had Josiah done this, he wouldn't have made a dumb mistake. Seek the word, read it consistently, read it comprehensively. Don't think, I'm just open up and see what God says to me out of a random verse. Yeah, sometimes he does that, but most of the time he's spoken to me is through my daily, consistent Bible reading. Do that, it will make every difference in your life. But Josiah didn't do it, and he made a dumb mistake. Not a sin, but something that shortened his life and the lives of his children. Number three, heed counsel from unexpected sources. Now this doesn't mean that everything everybody says to us we need to take to heart. But we need to be clothed with humility and recognize that sometimes God speaks to us in unexpected ways. So let's, let's turn to 2 Chronicles 35. Especially we actually read the verses about what happened to Josiah. And I want you to see what Pharaoh says to him in 2 Chronicles 35. And then we'll, we'll look at verses 20 through 25. So 2 Chronicles 35 verse 20 after all this all these great things Josiah did when Josiah had prepared the temple Necho king of Egypt came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates and Josiah went out against him but he Pharaoh sent messengers to him Josiah saying what have I to do with you king of Judah I have not come against you this day but against the house with which I have war for God commanded me to make haste refrain from meddling with God who is with me lest he destroy you nevertheless Josiah would not turn his face from him but disguised himself so that he might fight with him and did not heed the words of Necho from the mouth of God God can speak to you through anybody or anything he even used a donkey one time in the Bible he used Caiaphas, the guy that was preparing to crucify Jesus, and suddenly Caiaphas gave a prophecy that was from God. God can give advice from unexpected sources, and so we need to have a humble, listening heart and not think, well, that person can't speak to me. I remember uh, when I was a senior in high school, somehow, and I don't know how, I still don't know how because I didn't apply for this, I got selected for this National Young Leaders Conference in Washington, D.C., and I was like the lone representative from Jeff High. I don't even know how this happened, but the next thing I knew, I was in D.C. 
And we were there. It was really cool. We got to go to all the places and meet all these politicians. And there were kids from all over the country. And we did like a mock Congress and all this stuff. And uh, there was some guy that I met up there. You know, you kind of just meet a few people. It was, it, was a, it was another kid that was there. And I would not say we were friends. We just had just a few conversations together. But it was, you know, a little more close to him than anyone else at this three or four day event. You know, I talk, we talked a little bit. I never told this guy I was a Christian. I never told him anything about my life. It was just, you know, where are you from? Where are you from? Small talk kind of stuff like that. Um, somewhere along the way, I found out he was, he was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, which, you know, I didn't say anything about what I was. I was a Protestant. You know, it's kind of the two divisions in Christianity. Um, so anyway... Uh, as I was there, it was my senior year, the spring semester, and I was making these big decisions about my life, and I felt, you know, for two years, or actually since about eighth grade, that God was calling me into ministry, but now the, the rubber was meeting the road. I had to actually, if I'm going to go into ministry, i got to go to college and study and major in that, or, or not, you know, so I'm, I'm turning all this over my head, God, is this what you want for me, and all this, and I remember that... I was sitting on my suitcase waiting for my grandparents to pick me up from Georgetown University, which is where this thing was. And as you know, Georgetown is a Jesuit school. It's a, a Roman Catholic school. And this guy, I don't even remember his name. He had red hair. That's all I remember. I don't even remember where he was from. He, he was walking past me. He saw me sitting there. And I said, well, what are you up to? And he said, I'm going to Mass over here. Uh, the, the, there's a chapel in Georgetown. I said, well, good. You know, and he, he started to walk away. And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, and by the way, you're going to make a fine preacher. And he turned and walked away. And I thought, what? I didn't tell him anything about me. He doesn't even know I'm a Christian. How does he know that this is like the struggle? But that was like God's confirmation to me, you need to go to ministry. Now, I could have been arrogant and said, well, look, I'm a Protestant and he's a Catholic. I mean, if God's going to speak to me, it's going to be from some evangelical Protestant person or whatever. Uh, but no, no. Uh, a Roman Catholic to me and said, you're going to make a fine preacher. And that was how I knew. It was a confirmation that I needed. My point I'm making is, don't put God in a box. Don't say, God can't speak to me through this person, or God can't speak through that person. Josiah thought there's no way Pharaoh Nico knew the will of God, but Nico did know. As a matter of fact... God was sending Nico to stop Babylon so they wouldn't capture Israel yet. They wouldn't capture Judah. But this whole fiasco, not only did Josiah get killed, but the delay that he delayed Nico with this battle, and that caused the Babylonians to beat the Assyrians, and then they came and destroyed the people of God. So this whole thing was a mess up. Pharaoh knew. He was actually listening to God. How did God speak to Pharaoh? I have no idea. If I ever meet that guy, I probably would never recognize him. But I met him like, I would like to say, how, how did, where did that come from? Why would you say that to me? Why, why would you look at a random person and say they will make a fine preacher and then just walk off? God speaks to us. But we need to have listening ears. And so again, in the book of James, in chapter 1, just a few verses after it talks about God giving us wisdom, he gives us a little hint at how sometimes God gives it. Listen to James 1, 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Sometimes God is talking to us, but we got to shut up and listen. And sometimes it's from unexpected sources that God's word will come. Now, we need to test everything and prove it. I mean, if, if God had not already been dealing in my heart, I wouldn't just decide to go in the ministry based on what this one guy said. But it was a confirmation from the Lord, from somebody that I believe was walking with the Lord, even though he was of a different denomination than I was. He was on his way to church when he gave me that word from God. All right, that's three of the things. We'll hasten along here to wrap this up. The fourth thing, when preventing an unwise mistake, is wait for God's calling before you jump into things. God never told Josiah to get involved in this battle. So Proverbs 26, 17 says that somebody who goes along and meddles in a quarrel that doesn't belong to them is like somebody who takes a passing dog by the ears. 
If you see a dog walking down the street and you just go up to it and grab it by the ears, what's that dog going to do? It's going to bite you. I remember when uh, when Brooklyn was little, she was a toddler. Um, Cindy had, uh, still has this dog, Ella, and Brian Anthony had been particularly mean to Ella, so Ella was kind of aggressive. And Ella was eating, and Brooklyn kept wanting to mess with Ella, and I kept holding her back. No, you're not going to do this. You're not going to do this. Leave that dog alone, you know, and all this. But finally, at a certain point, Brooklyn was crying, throwing a fit. I, I just felt like, you know what? Let her do it. So she went up, grabbed a hold of Ella while Ella was eating, and Ella turned around and bit her. And she cried, and I thought, she learned a lesson here. Sometimes you and I get involved in stuff that's none of our business. As a matter of fact, did you know the phrase, mind your own business? We hear it a lot, but did you know that it actually comes from the Word of God? 1 Thessalonians 4.11 that you may aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. God told the people at Thessalonica, be quiet and mind your own business. Josiah didn't. He got involved in something that had nothing to do with him. We would never do that, right? Except when we're sitting there on the computer and we're like, well, somebody on the internet is wrong. Somebody on here is wrong. Boy, it's my job to straighten them out. It's my job to get on Facebook and get involved in everybody's business and everybody's mess and everybody's discussions. I've just got to be into everything. The devil is always trying to get us distracted. A few years ago, our church was called to minister up in Pleasant Ridge, and uh, and we we saw souls saved, and and some people actually come to our church uh, that God brought here because of that. But when we got up there, we didn't know all this craziness was coming politically. I had no idea. But about a month after we started there, or around the same time, all of a sudden, it revealed that there were different visions from the city of Charlestown, uh, and, and then different visions of the people of Pleasant Ridge about what was going to happen to that neighborhood. Again, we didn't know. We were just going up there to minister. We didn't have any idea any of this was coming. Nobody told us. And the next thing we knew, both sides were trying to get us to get on their side. Uh, we were getting pressure from city Hall and pressure from Pleasant Ridge Neighborhood Association, and um, and 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 depending on who you talk to, they both making pretty compelling cases. And I remember praying with the elders, praying with the staff here at the church, and praying myself and saying, "God, you know, what do you want us to do? I mean, you put us up there. Maybe we can help bring peace to the community. Do this, that, or the other." And God was emphatic: "This is none of your business. Stay out of it. I mean, minister to the people. Seek to." save souls, don't get involved in fighting City Hall or joining City Hall or fighting with the people in Pleasant Ridge or against the people in Pleasant Ridge. Stay out of it. Josiah got involved in something he had no business getting involved in. We need to be very careful that unless God is calling you, then don't, don't get involved in something. Unless God is calling you, don't jump into something you shouldn't be involved in because at the end of it, you just get hurt because he doesn't protect us when we're where we don't need to be and involved in something we don't need to be involved in. So whether it's a family dispute or something going on with your neighbor or something on the internet or whatever, sometimes it's best to just stay out of it and mind our own business unless God tells us to get involved. And the last thing to avoid, if you remember when we were looking at the Second Chronicles passage, it said that when Josiah went into this battle, he disguised himself. You know, if you want to do a fun study, read in the Bible about people who disguise themselves. It never works in Scripture. Never. Even if they're good people trying to do it, just they all, everybody always knows who they are. It just always falters and fails. You know you're about to make a mistake if you feel the need to manipulate people or events. Well, if I just manipulate this a little bit or manipulate that or kind of pull some strings here or there. You see, Josiah was disguising himself because deep down he knew he wasn't where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to do. So he couldn't boldly go into battle. He had to sneak and disguise himself and kind of manipulate the situation. If God is with you, there's tremendous confidence 
You don't have to fudge that that application. You don't have to fudge that quote. You, you don't have to, you know, do these things uh, that, that are underhanded or sneaky or just a little manipulative or whatever. You just be real and honest. That doesn't mean you tell every secret about yourself and everything else and let all your, 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 your dirty laundry hang out. But you don't have to disguise and manipulate and operate in an underhanded way. If God is with you, then you will succeed. And if not, that underhandedness may allow you to get that job or to, or to win that contract or to get that promotion or to win that spouse or whatever. So you might think later, oh boy, I wish I'd just been honest because this is a disaster. Now, I promised you at the end, we would say, well, what happens if I do make a mistake? I mean, this is not a sin. God did not condemn Josiah for this. You know, in the New Testament, Paul was bound and determined to go preach to Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit kept saying, this is not a good idea, Paul. He didn't tell him no, but it wasn't a good idea. And Paul ended up going to jail and all this. But Jesus said, hey, look, I'm still with you. We're still going to accomplish your purpose in your life. There's going to be some consequences. There were consequences to Paul. There were consequences to Josiah. When you and I do dumb things, there are consequences. But God is not done with our life. So I will leave you with this, which I think is pretty cool. Josiah was the last good king to ever sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He had four children who, all, who sat on it temporarily after him. They were all wicked. And they all ended up killed or captive and the country fell um, in just short order after Josiah died. He was the last good king in Jerusalem. He wanted his people to follow God. He wanted his people to be holy and righteous. It was a passion of his life. And he wanted to protect them, which is why he was involved in this battle. You know where this battle took place? He met Pharaoh Necho in the valley of Megiddo. So what? Well, let's do a little quick Hebrew lesson. The Hebrew word for valley is ar, A-R. And, uh, and Megiddo is Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, our Megiddo. Starting to sound a little more familiar? The New Testament is written in Greek. It talks about this valley, one place, but it, it does it slightly with a Greek, a Greek twist, and it calls it Armageddon. Armageddon. The, the valley of Armageddon is where the last good king of Israel died. He lost the battle and his people were defeated in the valley of Armageddon. And since the time of Josiah, there has not been a good king on the throne in Jerusalem. But the book of Revelation tells us that there's going to be another battle in Armageddon in the valley of Megiddo, in the place the last good king died. There's going to be another battle there. All the forces of the enemy and the Antichrist will be gathered together to do the final solution, the destruction of the Jewish people to wipe them out. And they will be succeeding until in the middle of the battle, the eastern sky splits. And the next good king to sit on the throne in Jerusalem comes riding from heaven. By the way, with all of us, we get to be part of this. And he will swoop in, defeat the Antichrist, defeat the enemies of evil, and bring in everlasting peace uh, on earth. And for the people of Israel, everlasting righteousness. They will never, ever turn aside from God again. And he will sit on the throne. You see, Josiah had a passion for his people to be holy and for his people to be safe. And he didn't see that accomplished. But God says, buddy, in the same place you were trying to do it, I'm going to do it in the exact same place. Only this time the king will be successful because the king will be me. And I will fix it. And the desire of your heart will come true. You see, the desire of Paul was to get to Rome, but he made this mistake going to Jerusalem, so he went to jail for four years. He was in a shipwreck. All kinds of things happened, but at the end of the day, he ended up in Rome. 
You might make a mistake. It may cause problems and consequences in your life. There might be lots of difficulties and things may not work out like you hoped altogether. But at the end of the day, if you're a child of God, He's going to be victorious in your life. He's going to accomplish His purpose in your life. He's going to use you for His glory. If I had moved to Chicago, my life wouldn't have been over. God would have had a different track, but He would have still seen His purpose accomplished in me. I'm sure I would have still been a pastor. I'm sure I still would have had a wife and children and all those things. It might have been a harder road, a more difficult road, but He will fulfill His purpose. So here's the thing. And you say, boy, I messed up. I really messed up here in my life. I, I just made this big decision. I didn't consult God. I didn't read the Bible. I just, I just jumped in and made it. Take heart. God is not done with you yet. And He still has for you a future and a hope and a glorious plan. And the important thing to do is just say, all right, Lord, next time I'm listening. Starting today, I'm reading. And I'm praying for wisdom. And God will accomplish you and give you the desires of your heart. Just like he did for Paul and just like he did for Josiah. Mistakes. We all make them. But God loves us even when we do. Would you stand with me today? Now there's something that's not a mistake. It's a sin. And that is to not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is a mistake, but it's far worse than a mistake. If you need Him as your Savior, won't you call on Him today? He's just a prayer away. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that today's message will help us all as we face decisions every day of our lives. Help us to avoid making foolish mistakes. Things that are not sin, things that are not prohibited, but that can cause us negative consequences. That can, that can stop for a time what is best for our lives. But Lord, I thank you that you're in the business of fixing our mistakes. One day you'll fix the mistake Josiah made and you'll bring in all the things that he desired in the exact same place in the Valley of Megiddo. Lord, I pray that you would, in our lives, fix our mistakes. We've all made them. Bring us to our desired haven. Give us the desires of our heart. Accomplish the purpose you have for us. But Lord, help us to avoid bad mistakes. And may no one avoid the worst mistake of all, or may no one do the worst mistake of all, which is to fail to trust you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray that if anyone hasn't done that, they would do it today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm here to